Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure and honor to get started with the 2019 Winter Enrichment Program and also to welcome the representative of the government, all the guests that uh, travel for long distances to reach KAUST. Welcome to KAUST. Greet also the community of KAUST that uh, seems to be pretty, pretty big today. Thanks for convening here. We're looking forward to having your support for the entire time of the, of the event. So, um, uh, the agenda today is uh, about the starting uh, inauguration speech by the Yves Nanou, Professor Yves Nanou, the Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Interim Vice President for Research. We will carry on with my own contribution to the agenda and the illustration of the program, uh, this two weeks long program. And of course, and last but not least, our distinguished guest giving the keynote lecture, Paolo Sassone Corsi. So without any further ado, invite on this podium, Yves Nanou. Thank you, Valerio. Salam alaikum, good afternoon. Can you hear me, Justin? Yes. Good, thank you. Welcome to everyone, welcome to you, Excellency Dr. Abdullah El Mahatani, Vice President of the Shura Council. Welcome to all of our academic dimension of our life. Today and over the web, you will learn about time and life science, how you are dependent, your body is dependent on time. Time and literature, time and arts, these are the different topics, et cetera, et cetera, that will be covered uh, during this WEP 2019. So I would like to end this introduction to thank uh, Professor Valerio Orlando and all the team, the WEP team, for all of the effort to put up a very bold and attractive, you will see that, program around the notion of time. So my last word and wish is to tell you, enjoy this program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve, I think. Um, right, so when I was uh, convocated, uh, in the Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs and uh, being asked, Valeria, would you be interested in um, taking the lead and, of uh, the WEP 2019? I said, well, yes, it's a an honor and duty, uh, but we have to come up with a, with a theme. But I shall have a theme. How, how come you have a theme? Yes, I do have a theme. I had it in my mind, okay, already, because of some readings independent from sites, okay, that I was... Uh, I was doing during those days. I came up with the idea of time. Why time? Time, the readings were about um, some books from famous architects or from fam famous writers and so on about the importance of how people live in what kind of environment, design cities, how cities are designed, how this influences people's way of participating, coming together how this influences communities. So to cut the long story short, how the model we adopt in economy, in, uh, in social organizations and so on, and therefore science or whatever, impacts people real life, okay, individual life. And what disciplines in science are contributing to a better life? And in fact, time, as Eve underlined, is probably the uh, most universal unifying aspect of life, okay. The second question was, uh, okay, time and silence. What do you mean, and silence? Yes, whatever. Exactly that. Time and, just think about it. Okay, this was the idea, okay. Uh, provoke a reflection in, in each individual person. Try to concentrate on that empty space, that moment of nothing, of silence, whatever, where basically the unknown dimension starts, okay? And that's where probably the world of science, the ambition to know more, and the world of, world of love come together. 
And the two things together is probably the best the two themes or knowledge, fundamental knowledge that bring people together. So in a word, I think this theme was bringing people together. And I'm so happy to see here so many people bringing, uh, convening here. So this was a bit the, the uh, philosophical inspiration behind it. But of course, uh, then it comes to the science and many other aspects. So if I'm going through uh, a few speakers that have been uh, a highlight. I wanted to highlight, give you a flavor of the 360 degrees uh, inspiration of this, uh, uh, of this complex event for this year. So Paolo Sosona Corsi, who is going to talk uh, uh, later on, is uh, the person who uh, are going to t teach us about clocks, health, nutrition, and how this is a matter of sync and responsibility. In a word, the fact that we have biological clocks governing all over, all over uh, all, all our cell activities during the day and during the night and this and that, but the importance of synchronicity in how these different organs start to talk to each other is crucial for health, but also for responsibility. How can we, we can educate and knowing from science our body to better feeding, for example, to better habits that can impact our health, even policymakers that somehow I have responsibility to think about that, so educating people. And we know this is a relevant, for example, uh, um, topic in the kingdom, uh, how important impact on nutrition and social habits and so on, and obesity or other related cardiovascular diseases and so on, how we can learn from science how to improve uh, these aspects of life. So um, another aspect, linked to this, uh, the president of uh, Slow Food International Organization. Slowness is a value in life, okay, time. How much time you spend together, to cook together, to you know, join together and so on, and how this impacts your, the quality of life in your personal relationships and so on. But also the importance of slowness in finding the time to understand and better value what you have, your traditions, your, your, the source of, uh, of your history and roots and so on, how this gives value to this, and how this impacts, for example, a better culture of food. Okay, and again, I think this is going to be a very exciting contribution of Professor De Croce in talking about this, his experience in international organizations. The genetics about time. So Mike Young, the Nobel laureate, was supposed to talk today, but for medical reasons, switched the, the date until tomorrow. But he is, he is one of the seminar uh, um, uh, researchers that uh, starting looking into uh, model systems like fruit flies, discovered the genes that actually in, the, in our genome and in any other genome govern the, the ability of our DNA to perceive time in, uh, in real life. This is spectacular work that is basically the foundation for all the disciplines that I've been talking about in biology. Um, and nowadays, there is also a lot of hope to uh, try to challenge time, and in particular challenge the time in aging or in organ aging or whatever, and try to reprogram somatic cells for the good, okay, starting from the stem cell biology and, and try to even to tackle the ability of cells to walk their way back from a given age to a younger age. And uh, Juan Carlos Bermonte from Salk Institute, nominated this year by Times Magazine, one of the 50 more influential scientists, uh, at the moment uh, managed in, in modern organisms to somehow uh, recapitulate and walk the way back the aging clock, resetting the aging clock of living organisms. And this is uh, now mechanistically incredibly exciting for future application in health and, and disease. Switching gears to universe, as Eve already introduced, that uh, the word time immediately brings you into the dimension of, well, universe. Are we, are we all alone in the universe, or where do you come from? Who are we? What, are, what is the basis of our materialistic or non-materialistic, immaterialistic dimension and space and time and so on? John Ellis from CERN and Cambridge is going to entertain us with this uh, fundamental topic, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be one of the highlights and most exciting times of, uh, of this event. Uh, Dr. Natarajan is going to talk and talk about one of the, the chasing the black holes. 
one of the most mysterious antimaterial uh, uh, the dimension of also one of uh, universe and uh, all the fundamental questions that even at the philosophical uh, like John Ellis also is going to introduce aspects that are being are going to be covered. We're very very happy to have you here. Now, time and astrobiology, people might laugh. Is there an astrobiology thing? And yes, there is. Because now, apparently, thanks to the emissions of uh, NASA and other countries like China and Russia, and so on, uh, people are looking for water and life in other, in other contexts. And this, apparently, is not just a uh, you know, fair fantasy, but it's something that's going to is making substantial progress and it's going to pose uh, fundamental problems in our understanding and concept of what is life can what is life like in other contexts that are different than our 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 uh, planet going back to biology time and consciousness so all of this all the language of science all the language of art expression whatever is part of the human being characteristics and goes along with the evolution of our frontal cortex that creates images of reality. In the end, is consciousness. And this is the contribution of uh, Giulio Tononi, professor at Wisconsin University, who is going to tell us and, uh, his reflections about what is consciousness. What is our, the way by time we build a visualization of reality and what is the, the, the re relationship with the reality itself? Okay, what is the is individual or it's something that is shared by, by many people, but in a neuroscientific also background. The other aspect is uh, one third of our life is spent sleeping. Good or bad, but anyway, that's where we are. And the biology of sleep is one of the most important impacting also issues in health, proper health. I think Paolo also will talk about this today. Professor Cirelli is gonna talk about this uh, today. But going into the more uh, human uh, science values uh, and general values, global values, I think the reflection that independently in the world, a long time, in different contexts, even unrelated, geographically, or culturally, and so on, human beings kept, uh, came, came up with the very same, very similar okay, representations of fundamental passions, feelings, dreams, whatever, beliefs, uh, or, uh, or even the technological advancements, whatever, is a matter of fact. And this is uh, one of the most mysterious and exciting, bringing together people, uh, also cultural experiences that uh, they recently opened uh, uh, Louvre in Abu Dhabi, Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi, uh, brought to the attention of the world and having the Middle East as the center of this cultural uh, proposal, I think. This is very exciting. We are honored to have Noemi Dose, curator of uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi part of it, and uh, bringing her, her, her experience and her vision in the context of, also of uh, Middle East. The, this is tightly linked to the time and civilization, in particular the contribution of Islam and Salim al Saini professor is going to tell us about the golden age of Islam and how this is, uh, uh, is now coming back uh, thanks to initiatives like Kaos or Louvre Abu Dhabi or many others that is uh, uh, bringing back the, the importance contribution of Islamic culture and Arabic culture to the global. We have writers, we have uh, fantastic people like Dava Sobel talking about the true story of uh, Longitude, it's, it's a spectacular uh, per personality that I'm sure everybody is going to, to uh, appreciate. Some of you have also followed the, the TV series by, by her. Another aspect is, uh, is time and speed. There is a, you know, the mythos of speed. Time, okay, everybody has to perform, going very fast, fine, okay, good. And that there's a lot of technology behind it, for the good or for the bad. And we had the privilege of having McLaren as a sponsor of, uh, of, um, of Kaust, uh, and the experience of a pilot. In, you know, in, you have to make certain decisions within milliseconds. And what is the point of view of uh, champions uh, in operating in F1? Or even in soccer, I think we will have Juventus uh, visiting uh, Kaust uh, tomorrow or so. I'm not a fan of Juventus, but it's okay. So, 
I think uh, learning from this, uh, and not Paula either, I think it's not, no, right? But, but I have strong opinions about that. But, uh, but um, learning from, uh, you know, sport champions to the point of view how they calculate time and so on, this is a, a unique experience with a number of reflections. We should not forget the value as opposed to, uh, you know, fast and, and, and perfect and performance and so on, the value of slowness in general. There are many people that experience time in a completely different manner. Elderly people or disabled people or others, or in this case of uh, 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 Joseph Shovanek, a representative of uh, uh, autistic type of uh, uh, patients and so on, that perceive time in a completely different manner. This poses problems and poses responsibility to the society, how to deal with them, what to learn also from them, their standpoint. Life is not just speed and performance, life is much more, it's dedicating. Uh, time to each other and love and care to people. So, a, con a time and economy. We have a distinguished speakers talking about the economy, but I would like to hi highlight one of them. This is uh, Professor Roger Wattenhofer from uh, ETH in, in Zurich, who is going is one of the most influential uh, people talking about uh, the uh, blockchain technology and how this impacts new models of internet, new models of uh, of economy and sharing in, in, and so on. This is going to, to open discussions also in the area of uh, artificial intelligence and other computer, computer science related project uh, aspects that are going to contribute on, on the topic of time. So, um, leadership, I think we you already have got familiar with our faces, but one face is uh, Marie-Laure Boulot director of the web office with whom I had the privilege to work for the past 10 years herself and uh, her team to bring together this amazing uh, enterprise and I'd like to already a round of applause a, a, a huge amount of work today it's our first day and I know how, there, how people out there are very nervous about that but I would like to highlight also the contribution of our students. This was the first time that the web uh, directly went to the students and said, hey students, you're not just you know, the customers, you should be a main actors because all together the university is you, okay? So I'm very proud to have uh, the, the opportunity to have to work together hand by hand with uh, also the representative of uh, uh, student council, Athir al that uh, took care of a particular part of the program. Of course, contribution, as I just said, about the science and other uh, aspects, but uh, we wanted to leave them space, okay? Create a space of freedom, uh, of creativity, contribution that, you know, the, the community of students here had to express at the top level as much as they could. So we came up with the idea of uh, transforming in a provocative manner Discovery Square into Times Square, it was a lot of work to figure it out, also to make it like New York-like. We got almost there. They will never know in New York anyway. But uh, I think this is going to, it's, it's a, the concept of square. Square where people come together, meet together, you know, they, they, they don't, you know, lose each other. And uh, it's going to be a, a, a place where for two weeks there will be activities around the clock. In particular, the, we will have music events, we will have a number of events, including a very rich film festival with a number of titles that are matter for, are related to time and so on, and, uh, offering people time, uh, opportunity to get together and uh, discuss and uh, share the experience of uh, what they learned during the day, but also to think about it during the night in, in the context of, uh, of a square. Okay, that was gonna be their square forever. Okay, that's about it. So my last word is about the logo. Some of you might have uh, looked into it and maybe uh, thought nice, okay, but probably most of you know, have no idea what it is, okay. Okay, it's a pendulum. Pendulum time makes sense, fine. But there is an image behind it. Uh, this is more related to, to biology. Um, this is uh, something that I'm also using as an argument to introduce Paolo Sassone Course's uh, uh, talk. So this roundish um, object, and I'm asking Mark now to start the movie that is behind it, uh, 
is actually the called nucleosome. Nucleosome is a can be defined as a universal functional unit of genome organization. So everybody's a, happy with the idea that the genome is DNA, and the DNA is in the cell. But this the DNA is in the cell, not alone. It's complex with this uh, uh, very well-conserved uh, small group of proteins that are everywhere in every genome in, the, in every species and so on, that creates a unit of very small unit, repeated millions and millions of times in the genome. And their function is to compact the genome. We have two meters of DNA in each of our cells, every of our cells. But at the end of the day, according to highly sophisticated rules, uh, geometrical, spatial, uh, fractal, you name them, and so on, there's a lot of uh, research behind it, to create it, that order that we can visualize and recognize as uh, chromosomes and uh, in their complete shape. Now, this complete shape means that there are individual small particles that look like small balls, but these balls connect the genome to the environment because they are the site of any chemical modification that allows the DNA or the genome to sense the environment, and in this way, depending on uh, chemical modifications that occur in the cell or in the larger environment, uh, learn execute different genetic programs uh, and uh, basically allow the genome to become an alive molecule. Okay. So the inter molecular interface between our DNA genetic program and the world and the reality is actually something else. It's called epigenome in a way. And this is the, the area of our chemistry, of our structure that allows us to build our own individual biological identity irrespective of our uh, DNA program itself. There is more that we can add during time uh, that depends on our choice, that depends on the quality of life. Uh, life is, uh, was generous enough with us already if we can input in the life itself. So we thought of uh, condensing this image in, uh, in, uh, in what you see in uh, in our logo to uh, include the, the biological aspect, the responsibility aspects, the physical aspects in one image. And I want to congratulate with the Yao Wei, the graphic designer in uh, Marilo's uh, uh, team who created this uh, together with me. And this is uh, exa uh, exa very exciting. A lot of work. And, uh, for Yao. For Yao. Yeah. Yeah. Good, 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 good. She deserves it, like anybody. Okay, I'm done so, uh, with my long speech about, about uh, this year um, program. And uh, my duty now is to intru introduce uh, Paolo Sassone Corsi, our guest distinguished speaker uh, today. Uh, Paolo is um, Italian in origin. Uh, he did his studies at the University of uh, Napoli. Then he carried on his career in, uh, mostly in France, where he sta is, uh, sta started also his, uh, his own lab in the late uh, 80s, at the beginning of the, of the 90s. Paolo is a um, uh, distinguished uh, professor nominated in the University of California, Irvine. He's a director of the Epigenetics and Metabolism Center there, and that's uh, where uh, our two roles crossed uh, together and uh, became also a good friend of, uh, of, uh, of KAUST. I think beyond the long list of uh, uh, acknowledgement, prizes, uh, and honors that Paolo uh, received along e in the years, both in the U.S. and, uh, and, and Europe and so on. I think what uh, uh, the major contribution of, of, in my opinion, of striking contribution that Paolo gave along the decades of his work is the vision that anticipated of decades, I would say, that uh, there is a chemistry behind uh, uh, genetics and, and epigenetics that we can understand. And this is the language of uh, how organs, how genes can talk to each other even at different distances or large distances. This chemistry is called metabolism. Now, for many of us, metabolism in the, back, in the old days in, uh, in uh, university meant boring, big, thick uh, books with a number of uh, you know, ugly formulas and so on, and no, not very exciting or fancy like molecular biology stuff. But in fact, we're getting back to that. 
and we are trying now to understand the fact that cells at the end of the day, thanks to nucleosomes, okay, thanks to the chemistry of DNA and so on, talk to each other because of metabolism. And now we go back to what I was telling you about in the very beginning of we can have an influence, bad, a good or bad influence on our body for, the, for that matter. So I think the vision, visionary work of Paolo brought the different fields together, now merging them in one bigger field that you know, uh, I think you can bring also his own, his own name and put his science and uh, all his collaborating with, uh, with, him, with him or collaborators, whatever, in a new dimension, a cutting edge dimension that was at the conceptual and technological level. So it's a great honor, Paolo, to have you here and uh, learn from you about uh, the provocative title was uh, You Are What You Eat and When? Something like that. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Paolo, for coming. Thank you. Looking forward. Well, thank you, Valerio. Um, let's, let's try this. Um, let's see if this works. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Valerio, uh, Marilor, and whoever is responsible for organizing this spectacular meeting and event. Um, and also thank you for being here today. Uh, what I'll try to do today is to tell you about what we do in our center uh, for epigenetics and metabolism, which is up here in the third floor of this building. Um, the, the center is itself um, connected to a number of additional centers that work on epigenetics and, and metabolism and nutrition all over California, but also the rest of the United States and also Europe. And, and we have a very strong and powerful collaboration here with cows that has been already very uh, productive. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of that at the end of my talk. Um, it, I, I'd like to, um, to first tell you about something that it always kind of interests me. It's like the human brain, the human mind is special uh, in terms of uh, what we are able to um, uh, really compute. For some reason, we don't compute well distances or time, since we've been talking about time. So if you look at evolution, and we'll talk about when life started on this planet, um, we talk about four billion years ago. And people don't just don't get it. He's like, so I like to talk about money. Money, everybody thinks about money. Money's fine. Four billion dollars. Everybody knows four billion dollars. Four billion years, you don't just don't get it. Now, do I have a pointer? Because my pointer doesn't work really well. Um, anyway, um, do you guys have a pointer? Maybe not. Okay. You don't see this. I'll do it with this. I'll do it with the, my arrow. Can you see the arrow? Yes. Okay. So look, it, it, four billion dollars um, uh, ago, <laughs> billion years ago. <laughs> I never had four billion dollars, so it cannot be four million dollars ago for me. But anyway, four billion dollars ago. Life started on this planet. And what has happened is that in the past $500 million is that we went from unicellular organism to more complex animals. Um, and everybody knows about dinosaurs and then the disappearance of dinosaurs and so on. When you look at this map, you look like there was one of those maps in the metro station in, in, in London or Paris. That's where you are. You are down here. This last 10,000 years, $10,000 is nothing compared to $4 billion, right? $10,000. That's where we are now, and that is what we have to deal about uh, in, in terms of biology and our physiology. So we are the result of 4 billion years of evolution and 4 billion years of the way how biological circuits pathways within our bodies has evolved. And we cannot get away from that information. We gotta think about it. So what has been mostly constant over these past couple billion years has been the rotation of our planet on itself. And that's why we have uh, day and night, 
And then we have seasons because the planet is now perfectly right on, the, on the, its own axis and its own uh, uh, level of rotation around the sun. Uh, but anyway, that's the detail in this picture. What is important is that that rotation, those 24 hours of rotation of the planet on its own axis, has been the most constant thing that we have in our planet, independently from all the rest, the geology and stuff like that. So what is this telling us is that life has adapted to those 24-hour cycles, day and night cycles, over the past four billion years, and has adapted so bad, so intensely, so deeply, that in my mind, it's not just adapted, but it's been developed, it's been evolved because of those 24-hour cycles. And I'll try to tell you during this talk about what we discovered in the way we think about these things. Anyway, it suffice to look at a parking lot. Uh, whether it's a coust or anywhere else. This is in England. Uh, you can see it's going to rain very soon, so it cannot be coust. Um, but you will see that the parking lot fills up and empties with a beautiful 24-hour cycle. People go to work, rightly so, and then they go back home, and then they go to sleep, and they have dinner before sleep. What is really happening is that more or less we all do the same thing over and over every day. We do it so much and so much is embedded in, in, in our everyday life that we don't even think about it. We don't even just, we just do it because it's our normal circuit. And most of you uh, will wake up in the morning and have breakfast, and most of you will go to work and then have a meal in the middle of the day, and then another meal later on, have some activity in between, and almost all of you will go to sleep, I, I presume, um, and then during those hours of sleep, things happen, and we'll talk about it. Um, and then you wake up again in the morning. This is every day. Why is so nicely timed? That's a question. And the other thing is, um, what happens when, like me, you should be asleep right now because I've just flew from California <laughs> and I'm not supposed to be here. So things happen in your body when you go and play around with those normal cycles. So everybody feels those, but some people in the history have started to look at those in a more uh, detailed fashion, try to understand them. And the very first fellow who described uh, real uh, uh, you know, biological rhythms or circadian rhythms, and I'll tell you precisely what that means, is this French guy, Jean-Jacques Dortu de Méran. So the fellow here, and we're talking about almost 200 years ago, um, was a famous astronomer and, uh, and naturalist, and he was really into all forms of uh, life form. And he was literally interested in understanding how life developed and how it was adapting to the environment and so on. So this fellow here, um, besides many other discoveries, was the first one that first described the movement of this plant leaves. This is the Heliotropium. Uh, it's a plant whose leaves are open during daytime and they close at nighttime. It was noticing that that will be beautifully dictated by the daylight cycle, but I also discovered, huh, that if you had to place the plant in a continuous darkness, the leaves will do the same job over and over anyways. So this was telling you for the first time, 200 years ago, that it was not just a matter of having the daylight cycle, but there was something intrinsic to the plant that was telling the plant to open and close the leaves, no matter what, independently from light. So there was something intrinsic. There must be something that's like what we call, and I'll tell you in a minute also more in detail, something free-running, some type of a clock that's free-running inside the plant, and I'll tell you also that inside each of you, um, that allows to have those rhythms embedded in your own physiological circuits. Um, about 100 years later, another French, um, even well more known than de Meran, uh, Claude Bernard, um, described for the first time a key concept in physiology. The concept is a homeostasis. This is a concept by which, in his, in his mind, homeostasis is really a balance of things in your body, is a concept by which 
any organism, any possible uh, organism on this planet is able to adapt to changes in the environment because homeostasis itself is not flat, it's somehow cyclic. If the physiology has to be cyclic in order to adapt to um, somehow be able to cope with changes in the environment. And when I say changes in the environment, I'm talking about seasons, I'm talking about different uh, food intake, different uh, drugs of abuse, uh, and so on. So these were the very first phases of the field. Um, and everybody now, is know, now knows that in one of the fellows that was supposed to be here, and unfortunately uh, uh, is not here, um, is Mike Young. Um, uh, that there were uh, three fellows here, three friends and colleagues, who were awarded the Nobel Prize um, a couple of years ago. Uh, Jeff Hall, Mike Rosebush, and Mike Young got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the first gene responsible for circadian rhythmicity in uh, an animal. Um, the reason I put this little guy here is because this fellow here deserves the Nobel Prize as well. He's a drosophila. He's a small fly that has been used in most labs in the world to understand the genetics of anything you can imagine, because genetics is so simple in the fly that has been used also by these three fellows here. So Jeff, Mike, and Mike got the Nobel Prize, highly deserved, but I'd like to stress here a story, a little story that I care for uh, very much, is that we all, um, we use the expression to walk on the, on the shoulder giants, and that's exactly the case for these three fellows, as for Claude Bernard and as for Demiran, but there are um, two people I'd like to stress here, and these are uh, Seymour Benzer and his student, uh, uh, Ron Konopka. The reason I want to stress this is because Ron and Seymour Benzer never got a Nobel Prize, but they were the very first ones that in 1971 had this seminal paper published in PNAS showing, uh, and that was Seymour Benzer fixation. He had the fixation about the fact that somehow um, behavior must have a genetic basis. So he was looking for all possible mutations in number of elements, including the drosophila, to understand whether a mutation in a gene will change behavior of, of any type, of any level. And he found this particular gene that he called per for the word period in the fly. Um, Simmer Benzer was a genius. He worked at Caltech uh, for, for all his life. Um, never had the Nobel Prize, but he, I think in my mind, he should have like five of them. So uh, incredibly impactful was his, uh, his research. Ron Konopka took over uh, the work by Simmer Benzer and uh, went on to clone and understand how PER works um, to end up then uh, um, uh, a bit forgotten a little bit by the field. Said this, um, now the field has grown so much that when I started, and I'll tell you a little story about this, but 20, 25 years ago in this field, I went to a meeting and the meeting was maybe 80 people. Now we go to the same conferences, there are thousands and thousands of people because this field has been able to collect fellows from um, uh, you know, in, in the neurology, from a cell cycle, from cancer, metabolism, and so on. So everybody's converging to this field because of the central importance of, uh, of these clocks and the rhythms. These rhythms are so important and so pervasive, as I've said, that everyone knows about it. These days, you can find these beautiful charts on popular literature, a magazine, so you can get anywhere you want. And these magazines is indicated also when is the best time for uh, your deep sleep, for... Um, um, for the high alertness, that's a good time to go sport, to do sports. Uh, this is a great time, 2 p.m., to go to the dentist because the, 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 you know, your body is less sensitive to pain. Go to the dentist at 2 p.m. When they ask you when to go to the dentist, tell the dentist, can I have an appointment at 2 p.m., please? Thank you. That's the best time. The time for ice body temperature and so on. In this particular chart, this is also the best time for love, which to me is a bit surprising. I thought that was... 24 hours, but anyway. Um, time for workout, for example, everybody has now on your wrist, I do, uh, some type of device that tells you when to be active, when to go and have food, what is the best time for you to, to, uh, to go for a run or to sleep and so on. Um, 
but yet, uh, we have still embedded in our minds some uh, uh, popular uh, ideas uh, to do exercise really early in the morning. And instead, it's really good to understand that this may be not the case. For example, the uh, early in the morning hours, between 6 and 10 a.m., that's when there's a peak of risk for stroke and cardiac arrest. So don't do sports at 6 in the morning. That's not good. Do sports, but later on in the day. So it's by studying these things that we understand how important is your normal rhythms because they will tell you what is the best to do one thing rather than another. Exercise, food, sleep, and so on. So what is really circadian? What it means and how much in your body is circadian? You'll be amazed to see that basically everything is. All these beautiful hormones that you probably heard about are all circadian in your body. You, you can look, for example, at the number of cells in the blood. They're also oscillating. The number of the cells in the blood is not the same. It's not constant during the day and night. It changes during the day and night cycle. So a lot is oscillating. How do I enter the field, I think, is telling you how impactful it was for us in the lab uh, this type of logic. At the time, I was in France, as Valerio mentioned, um, and we were working on a transcription factor. The transcription factor doesn't matter what it does. I mean, it, it, we don't, I'm not going to go into the molecular details, but I can tell you that this transcription factor was expressed in the pineal gland, which, of course, I had no idea what it was at the time. So I went to, back to the books. I'm talking about real books, not internet, right? They're like the ones that you actually open and, and move pages to read um, and, and study what the pineal gland was. And the pineal gland was described by a French uh, philosopher that everybody knows, René Descartes. Um, we're talking about five centuries ago. What René Descartes was describing was this pineal gland like the third eye or the center of the soul. It wasn't so far to be right because the pineal gland is originated embryonically from the same cells that will make the retina. And in fact, in birds, in fishes, in reptiles, the pineal gland is photosensitive as the same cells and is able to respond to light. Anyways, at the time I had this fellow here, German postdoc, the first name in this paper, that uh, came to the lab and told me, I want to study that transcription factor in the brain. It's like, who cares about the brain? I mean, I didn't, at the time, I really didn't have that kind of interest. Um, anyway, he did, and um, he came up with this picture. This is now what we've called an in situ hybridization of the expression of this particular gene in the brain. This is the brain of a mouse, and this is the expression of that gene in the pineal gland. It's like, this is the pineal gland. I don't know what that is, but that's amazing because basically it's expressed only there in a lot. So I was interested in understanding what that is. And uh, um, I knew that the pineal gland makes a hormone called melatonin that you probably heard about. This is a hormone that will dictate your sleep and wake cycles. I thought this was really exciting. So I asked the technician in the lab, uh, the French technician, to go and redo this experiment, well, I told the German postdoc to go and do more molecular studies on this gene. And the French technician uh, came up with um, this picture. Uh-oh. So it's like, OK, two options <laughs> in my mind. The German postdoc wasn't doing the right experiment, or the French technician wasn't doing the right experiment. The reality is they were both doing the perfect experiment. The simple difference was that the, the German postdoc will go to the lab late in the day. It will sacrifice the mice in the evening, while the, post, the, the, the French technician will go early in the morning in the lab and will sacrifice the mice in the morning. That was it. So we discovered that this gene is expressed dramatically differently in the pineal gland during day and night. And we discovered then, together with Solomon Snyder at Johns Hopkins, that um, is the product of this gene that controls the synthesis of the hormone melatonin. So we connected the transcription in the gene expression of this particular gene to the production of a hormone. This was 25 years ago or more, and that was to me like, 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 a, like someone gave me a key to open a new world. And I was like, wow, this is so exciting. 
That means I can go and discover this in more detail. And at the time, the field looked like this. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. I loved it because basically I had all the chances I wanted to go and roam on the beach, on the top of the palm tree, look over the other islands, swim in the water. There is so much to do. It was a completely open field and we could do whatever we wanted. Today the field is more like this. Uh, um, lots of people come in. <laughs> we have to carve our own little space down here or down here and then try to find things that are still uncovered. But uh, believe me, the field has so much to be discovered that is uh, super exciting. Anyways, um, what we do in our center is really to try to understand, and as Valerio mentioned in his introduction, um, how the environment uh, talks to homeostasis, which I told you is cyclic in order to be able to adapt and uh, cope with the changes in the environment. And we believe that the key interface here is actually epigenetics, and I'll tell you also a bit more about that. Now, when I talk environment, I talk about the light-dark cycle, so the day-night cycle, um, exercise, nutrition, drug abuse, and so many other possibilities. All these things that the environment is impacting on our own biology every day. Now, what we discovered in the past 10 years, and we've been having several um, uh, proofs of what I'm telling you, is that a good chunk of this epigenetic interface is driven by the circadian clock. Now, what is really epigenetics? Um, well, I introduced that very briefly, and I'll tell you that uh, the work by uh, uh, an English developmental biologist, Carter Wallington, um, uh, we talked about more than 50 years ago, um, was uh, depicted by this uh, image of landscape. The question that uh, Waddington had, uh, and still he's hunting many scientists, is the very, very simple. How is it possible that in every organism we have the same DNA in every cell in our body, and yet you end up with a neuron or a adipocyte, or a muscle cell, or a liver cell, and yet have the same DNA? Well, his idea is that equal cells with the same genome will like marbles, that's the imagery, whereas marbles will just roll down different types of hills or valleys, and depending on the landscape, they will just become different. They will just integrate different types of inputs to become either a neuron or a lipocyte. Well, the thing is and that we believe now that this landscape is the epigenome and the chromatin that I'm going to tell you about in a second. So the thing is, that every cell in our body is uh, full in the nucleus of DNA so much that there are two meters. For the Americans, not too many probably here today, 6.5 feet in every cell. That is exactly how Kobe Bryant is tall. Now, why I'm showing this with Kobe, uh, Lakers ex-player uh, will train on our campus, so I'll see him all the time. The guy speaks perfect Italian because his dad was playing in Italy, um, so he, he grew up in Italy, and I will see him at the coffee shop, and I'll talk to him, and people are like, why Kobe's talking to that bold guy in some strange language? Um, the reason I'm showing the picture is like, Kobe has many, many cells in his body, just like all of you, and each cell has a, has a nucleus of a 10 micron, tiny little nucleus, and yet, in that nucleus, there's two meters of DNA in every single nucleus. There's so much DNA in each one of you that if we put all those DNA uh, filaments next to each other, we will cover the distance from the Earth to the Moon 100 times. 100 times. That's how much DNA we have in each single individual in this room. So as um, Valera showed, the question is, the way that two meters of DNA is organized is critical because through that amazing organization, we can have a compaction that allows the DNA to be then inserted in that such a small nucleus. I'd like you to notice those little tails that stick out of the nucleosome here. Well, I already told you what DNA does. It wraps around each single nucleosome twice. 
This happens 60 million times in every single nucleus, in every single cell in your body. Um, what we really like to understand is how is it possible that this extremely complex and compacted structure, we can have gene expression, the activity of genes, or their silencing that is um, precisely timed and be at the same time physiologically meaningful so that those, it, those impacts from the environment will do that job on the DNA, on this complex epigenome to realize that you have a neuron and a deposite or maybe a neuron which has different kinds of thinking or different type of activities. So remember those tails. Those tails are like platforms. Platforms like the ones you have at the airport where the airplanes will just land. On those tails, things happen all the time so that there are changes that are brought about a number of enzymes that uh, we like to call riders and razors. These enzymes are able to integrate what happens in the cell in terms of metabolism, in terms of physiology. These enzymes have been developed, have been evolved during billions of years to be extremely precise in their job. They know where to do it, how to do it, and when to do it. And what they do by doing that job is to connect metabolism to the epigenome. The reason they do that is because in order to do their job, they get to look at these things they call metabolites. Now, I'm not going to go through the details. I don't want to bother you with this. But please, look at this simply by looking at their names, SAM, acetyl-CoA, ATP, and so on. Glucose, everybody knows glucose is by reading and consuming those metabolites that you change the epigenome. And thereby, we want to understand what the, where those metabolites come from and what changes their levels, their activities, so that will change also the epigenome and the reaction and the responses in every cell. Now, where those metabolites come from, you know this, guys, right? We all know them by heart. Remember school, where we were studying all those metabolic cycles? Well, of course, you don't. I didn't. Uh, and I had to go back to the books again to, to understand them. Well, I'm not going to detail what, what they are. I'm just going to tell you one thing, is that by a number of analyses I'm going to show you at the end of my talk, um, we were able through what we call metabolomics, so it is a complex uh, biochemistry, uh, to read more than 1,000 metabolites in every cell or in every organ at a specific time. So what we did was what we called a circadian metabolomics analysis to go and look at how many of those metabolites will change along the circadian cycle, along those uh, day-night cycles in every organ. And what we discovered, and this is an example just in the liver, is that 50% of metabolites in the liver are actually oscillating. Your metabolism is not flat. His own metabolism is changing day and night. And that tells you something very important because it tells you that the way you're going to impact that metabolism, the way you're going to challenge it somehow, is going to be important for your health. So um, let's go and talk to you about, very briefly, about what clocks are and where are they and why they're so important and how we believe they connect to each other. Well, concept number one. These clocks are free running. They are no matter what running. You can be in complete darkness. Those clocks will keep going. The example in the top is the example of a mimosa flat that is uh, whose opening and closing of the leaves is independent of the light signal. And the experiment below is a mouse that will have a beautiful daily activity that is independent from the light dark cycle. You can put those mice in a constant, very dim light, and they will keep going with the 24 hour cycle. Experiments in humans have been done where humans have been actually going into a cave for three months, and their normal circadian activity will keep going. So we have an embedded free running clock inside ourselves that then needs to be somehow adjusted. The word circadian comes from Latin. It means circadian. It means those are about a day cycles. Um, and those are conserved all the way from cyanobacteria to plants 
to insects, to humans. What happens during the, uh, let's say, night travel or your travel or during the, the season, is that you need to readjust those rhythms with something that we call Zeitgeber. That's a German word that means time giver. The most important time, Zeitgeber is light. And that's what happens. That's what happens to me, right? I have this strong electric light on my face that is telling me that I got to wake up. I cannot sleep at this time. So my internal clock has to cope with the external environment, has to readjust. Thank God it's pretty uh, plastic. is able to do that quite well. It's very flexible. Now, the, 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 the transcriptional, the organization of the clock is complex. I'm not going to go too much into detail here. But what is really important is it able to, has been conserved also through evolution. You could take the fly that was described by the three Nobel Prizes, uh, Hall, Young, and Rosebash. You take those flies and the mouse or hus, humans, the organization, the structural organization, and the conceptual way the clock works in every cell is basically the same, conserved through evolution. And the genes have been cloned, and, uh, uh, and that's pretty amazing because now we know so much about how they work, and their proteins, how they talk to each other, and how the mechanism works. And I'll show you a little video to show you that. All right, where is the clock physically in our, in our body? For decades... And we still believe that the central clock is in the brain. What really happens is that light hits the retina, and there are specialized neurons in the back of the retina called ganglion cells. Then the light signal travels the retinal epithelial tract all the way to the hypothalamus. In the hypothalamus, there are 20,000 neurons that constitute what we call the pacemaker or the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Those 20,000 neurons have the amazing capacity of oscillating no matter what. You can place them in culture. They can separate them from the animal, put them away from the animal, it will still oscillate with a beautiful 24-hour cycle. So what we believe is happening in, in those neurons is that that's the center clock. That's the clock that will function all the time. It needs to be readjusted by the light signal that comes through the eyes. But a discovery that was key to the field about 20 years ago was that really we have clocks everywhere. We have clocks in every single tissue, in every single organ in our body, in every single cell. So what we do have is that the, the SCN in the hypothalamus receives the light signal through the retinal hypothalamic tract. Then the central clock talks to all our peripheral organs. These constitute the peripheral clocks. And the, the way they talk is through humoral signals. We can talk about this for a long time. If you want, we can do that during questions. Um, but we're really interested in this. And you can uncouple. You can somehow talk to the peripheral clocks through a, two additional ways. One is physical exercise. The other one is feeding. Food is critical here. Because food, you can do feeding at different time of day and night. If you do food intake at the wrong time of the day, you'll start uncoupling. You'll change the normal alignment between the central clock and the peripheral clocks. So it's critical to do both feeding and exercise at the right time when the clocks can be still aligned. So this was a key discovery. So the key discovery is that, yes, we believe there's a clock in the brain, but really there are clocks everywhere. And what is really critical to understand how they are synchronized what is the coordination among those? The other key experiment and discovery that was also done about 20, 15, 20 years ago is that um, there are lots of genes that are circadian. Now, thousands and thousands. We have 25,000 genes in every cell, and they're functional. Now, if you go and take you know, experiments where you can collect um, the expression of uh, genes along the, this different times, this is the liver, you will see in this, uh, it's called a uh, heat map of genes expression. The red means high express, green means not express. You can see there is beautiful ways of expression along the cycle of these thousands of genes. The reason for that is because from a molecular standpoint, the mechanism is such that those genes are all responsive to the clock mechanism. So what is really happening is that Thousands and thousands of genes in our body are cyclic, just like the metabolism. And that cyclicity is dictating the way we function. 
What happens when somehow we disrupt these 20, these all, these thousand, thousand genes, when we disrupt the alignment between the clocks? When we do that, things happen. For example, you're going to hear, I think, at this meeting about sleep, and uh, obviously the sleep wake cycle is strongly linked to the circadian cycle. So you disrupt the clock somehow, and I'll tell you in a minute how you can do that. You have obviously a problem in the sleep wake cycle, you have insomnia, you have depression and anxiety. For example, um, fellows that live in the uh, very northern hemisphere, like Finland and so on, they have a very little light during the winter time. They go into depression. It's called seasonal affective disorder. Uh, and experiments in the mice also show that disrupting the clock will increase anxiety. Um, you have metabolic disorders. They'll tell you that how. And you have great levels of inflammation. You have accelerated aging. The aging phenotype, the, pox, the fact that you age more or less is linked to the clock function. And you have uh, also busy diabetes. In cancer, suffice to say that um, uh, ladies who work a night shift, uh, let's say nurses or flight attendants, those ladies have an increased risk, about 40% increased risk of breast cancer. And that's a well-known fact. And in fact, it's so well-known that in a country like Denmark, um, that is considered as a risk factor, and Medicare will help you uh, if you're a female working in Denmark and you have breast cancer. So when we disrupt the clock, let's go back to this picture. Well, we disrupt the clock when we are here in the Holocene. Um, these are the past about 12,000 years. We are in 2019. What we did, what we all did, is that we introduced something after four billion years of evolution, after four billion years of a normal uh, circuits of biology, we introduced things such as electric car, electric lights, television, cars, airplanes, internet, Facebook. So this is like a stick of dynamite in our body. It's like a stick of dynamite in our physiology, which has been organized over a billion years to be in a certain way, what we've been doing is to change in that only in 150 years, which is nothing compared to the biological time. So you disrupt the clock when you, uh, let's say, uh, look at Facebook uh, too much at 2 in the morning or you watch a movie. Look at what happened in the area where I live. That's in L.A., uh, down here in Los Angeles. Um, this is only the past 50 years. The amount of electric light has increased not tenfold, not twentyfold, but 250-fold. That's how much more electric light we have today compared to only 50 years ago. This is doing something dramatic to our physiology. Um, this is the stick of dynamite I was mentioning. Um, another way to disrupt the clock is food, or you got to be careful what you do. So um, everybody knows it's important what you eat and how much, right? Everybody's talking about don't have too much sugar, uh, everybody talks about don't eat uh, too many cheeseburgers uh, and so on. Right, sure. But what is really important that for you to know is also important when you eat. This is a perfect epigenetic experiment. And we um, summarize all this in this uh, review article. Um, these are mice, but these experiments have been done in humans as well. So, um, um, and what we do is what we call time-restricted feeding. Um, you take these mice, which are exactly the same. They're homozygous twins. Um, this, and they're fed the same diet. We're talking about the same diet, same number of calories and type of food. This fellow here is fed at the right time of day. This fellow is fed at the wrong time of day. He's like to say, you want that cheeseburger really bad? Please have it at midday, not have it at midnight. What happens at midnight is that you're going to disrupt those Beautiful cycles of metabolism I showed you before that are prepared to digest food, not to get more food at the right time. So what you're doing is going, you're going to put those metabolic cycles, those genes, into an amazing level of stress. And that's something you shouldn't do. Otherwise, you get fat. And you increase your chances of, or risk, rather, of being diabetic or have cardiovascular disorders. So how is it possible that all those genes who function so well in a, such a beautiful manner? Now, bear with me because this is a bit more complicated, but I'd like to show it to you. It's a video that shows you molecularly what really happens. This is the daytime. 
is the sun. And this is a cell. And you have good guys, B, Mal, and Clock, and the bad guys, Per and Christ, the repressors. They control 15% of all the genes in the cell. Now, for simplicity, they're going to fuse. The activators will transcribe those 50, let's say, 2,000, 3,000 genes, but they also transcribe the repressors, Per and Cry. There are several levels of control. One is transcription, one is translation. The repressors will be made and then translocated into the nucleus. You will see that by the time they're all in the nucleus, as at this time, it's nighttime. That's the moon, right? By the time they're all in the nucleus, they will go and repress their own expression. That's what happens every day in your cells. And then there's another level of complexity. The control is the disruption of the repressors. There are all pathways in the cell that have been developed to make sure that that happens. By the time all the repressors are gone, you have the expression going up again in this daytime again. This happens every day in every cell in your body. These amazing complex uh, mechanisms of transcription regulation, of gene expression regulation, happens all the time in your body. Now, I realize that uh, time is getting short, so I will go and try to tell you a little story very quickly that will tell you why this all is so important. So let's take this example. That's what I don't want to be uh, uh, after so many years in the United States. Okay? That's something that you want to avoid. And I'm trying my best. And the way to do this is to control myself, but at the same time also to study exactly what uh, I'm going to tell you. And this has to do with um, this lady right here, a great postdoc in the lab. She discovered what we call a reprogramming. So the clock itself is a system that can be reprogrammed, can be changed depending on the situation. So what we did is very simple. Imagine now to do this on yourself. Uh, we take mice uh, and we feed them, feed them a normal diet or we feed them a high-fat diet. And at the end of 10 weeks, we collect these various samples, various tissues. I'm not going to show you this. I'm going to show you only this. These are now the thousands of genes that I told you are oscillating beautifully in the liver after a normal diet. So this fellow is eating, um, let's say, vegetables, um, some cheese, <laughs> good fish. Um, he has all those genes oscillating beautifully. They put these mice in a high-fat diet. That means that cheeseburger, especially at the wrong time of day, all those genes, they lose oscillation. This is what happens in your body when you have that kind of food. The other picture here that is, I think is even more exciting is the fact that you can change your clock by having high-fat diet because you start the oscillation of all new kind of genes. You have a new clock happening, and that's a clock. You're not, if you get bad food, you're not losing your normal circadian activity. You just change it. And all these genes now are actually active under high-fat diet. Those genes are the one giving you inflammation, giving you heat shock response, giving you stress responses. I'm going to finish by telling you a little concept. It is a concept that we call communicating clocks. What we believe is happening in our body, in the body of a mouse or a plant and so on, is that all these clocks or these cells talk to each other. And how to do it is what we like to understand. So I'm going to show you one data, one piece of data that I think uh, is of excitement uh, for you. These experiments done another great postdoc in the lab, Selma Masri. The question we had is, is it possible that if we have a pathology, um, that pathology is changing the normal activity of a different organ that is even far away from the pathology? So we took this example of a lung adenocarcinoma. This is a really bad cancer in, in lung. That cancer will cause death in most uh, people. Uh, but we have a beautiful mouse model that allows us to study this lung adenocarcinoma exclusively when it's developing in the lung. And the question we had, is it possible that the lung carcinoma, that cancer, is changing the normal metabolism in a different tissue? So the question was, is it possible that changes, for example, our liver metabolism? Now, the answer is obviously yes. 
in a normal situation, that homeostasis is perfectly synchronous, they work together, but when you have a cancer in the lung, you change the homeostasis in the normal activity in the liver, so you have inhibition of the insulin signaling, you have altered uh, glucose sensitivity, and you have deregulated lipid metabolism. Why is this important? It's important because a cancer patient is going to get a chemotherapy, and that chemotherapy has to be given at the right time of day. You give the wrong time of day, that chemotherapy is not going to work as well. And we get to take into account this because we get to take into account the fact that the liver in a cancer patient who has a lung adenocarcinoma is not going to be the normal liver. It's going to be a different liver. So it's really going to be important for our society to go and study this in more detail. Um, and I think that the future is really um, in what we call a chronopharmacology, that is the pharmacology provided at people at the right time of day or night. And in order to do this, we decided to go and embark into a large um, study that was done in collaboration with Valerio here at Kaust um, and Pierre Magistretti. Uh, and we even had the chance to have a, a great student from Kaust visiting us, uh, uh, Seba Nadif, and they're all authors in this paper. What we did here is to uh, approach the question of uh, global metabolism by going and look by metabolomics at thousands of metabolites in each single organ and understand how they will change in response to a normal diet or a high-fat diet. You don't have to understand the details here. So what is important to see is this picture where in normal chow, so that's when you eat a normal thing, you have the various organs connected here, liver, serum, brown adipose tissue, muscle, those lines indicate perfect coordination. Those lines indicate that they are talking to each other. They're communicating in a synchronous, aligned manner. You place these mice in a high-fat diet, and you will see that those lines disappear in large part, and new lines are also developing. So what we're telling you is that not only when you have the bad food, you're going to have disruption of your normal metabolism in the liver, but what you're really doing, you disrupt those communications in the normal alignment and coordination of our tissues. Is this rel relevant to humans uh, since we've done this in the mouse? The answer is yes. In this other study, um, we, we compared the metabolomics in the human samples from patients uh, um, in a normal uh, situation or under a high-fat diet by checking the situation in the serum versus the muscle. Uh, so indeed, we believe that this is the future for what we call personalized medicine, where we can go and analyze biometabolomics in profiling fellows, everyone here, uh, or in schools, in hospitals, in gym gymnasiums, uh, and understand how the metabolism is changing in this modern society. And I believe this has to do a lot with the concept I told you, which is communicating clocks. And to go back to understanding how they communicate, I'd like to stress the title of my talk, uh, uh, We Are What We Eat. These paintings are from Giuseppe Arcimboldo, uh, an amazing uh, painter from five centuries ago who was painting the faces of people by uh, showing different types of uh, vegetables uh, or food. So we are what we eat. Important to do at the right time, not just what you eat and how much, but when you do it and try to control the, the way the, the various clocks in the body are communicating is going to go through the right timing during daytime, nighttime, of exercise, of activities, sleep-wake cycle, and of course, nutrition. Uh, I'd like to thank the people in the lab, and I'm not going to go into mentioning them. This is not my campus, but we're not far away. This is called Crystal Cove. It's a state park in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Orange County. The campus is just below, behind us, these bushes, only five minutes away from the beach. You're all welcome to come and visit anytime. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hope it works. Thank you very much, Paolo, for this great talk. Now, 
the session is open for, for questions. A few questions there. Let me start with one, Paolo. I think the, the concept that there is a crosstalk between different tissues is uh, rather revolutionary. In a way, at least in the Western world medicine, the concept is that somehow organs are individual pieces of a, of a motor, of an engine. Right. Okay. Whereas in the Asian type of uh, philosophy is completely different. Right. Okay. It's true. Can you comment on what is the long-term perspective of this type of medicine, what you call precision medicine? Right. So it, 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 it's true that in the, in, in the past, I will say, 30 years, uh, Western medicine has um, concentrated on developing tools that will go and study in, the, in depth, let's say, uh, a pathology in the liver or in the muscle uh, or in the brain without really taking care of the rest of the body. Um, this has brought us to a huge amount of information and knowledge about the factualities of every single tissue and the way different cells will work to each, you know, connected to each other within that tissue. But we've been forgetting how those are connected to the rest. And we know today that... Um, the Asian medicine felt that uh, without going into detail and understanding really how things work. Um, but today, I think we are really at the, um, um, at the forefront of what might happening, like a new uh, level of understanding in the endocrinology and physiology. I think there is a whole world to discover there that has not been approached yet. So I think we're going to rewrite some of the books of endocrinology in the next 10 years. Thank you. Over there. Well, there must be somebody. Does, is this working? Yep. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so my question to you is, um, do you have a very specific clock with, uh, with, with the, the, the one that shows kind of noon and midnight? And um, it shows specifically what time is for what kind of purpose. Is this a hyperbole, or is this something that should be taken literally, such that you know, 10 p.m. for everybody is the same? That's a great um, question. And, right. And, and just to move on from that question, yep. um, you also mentioned that people in different locations will have uh, will will have this clock kind of affected. Uh, due to epigenetics, does that mean maybe they're they're adapting to changing their own clock, right? Um, or, or is it the same for all humans? Okay. No, no, those are all good questions. So, um, mind that what we do in the lab is with mice, which are more genetically equal. So, when we have a population of mice that are all equal, we know that what we're going to get is basically the same response from each one of them. And while we know that in this room, at least, I'm 100% sure, we have so many different normal types. We, I'm a night bird, then you have the guy that goes to, you know, woke up really early in the morning, early bird, and so on. So there are all these uh, possibilities. In humans, the situation is way more uh, differentiated and uh, uh, different from individual to individual. But however, however, um, uh, the principle is not changing. Uh, I can be a night bird and still need to have the same distance between my time of going to bed and my time of waking up. I'm not going to have a four-hour four, four hour sleep night only because I go to bed at 2 a.m., right? So th th what is really important is that maybe the whole cycle is shifted a few hours from each one of us, but the principles are the same, which is um, respecting the uh, fasting time. And fasting is when we sleep, right? We sleep, but it's also fasting. That's why we do breakfast. We, keep, we break the fasting uh, and so on. So the, those, the, that, that distance is critical to be kept. Now, the question you had about the epigenetics, and I, I tried to convey that, but it's complicated, is very simple. And it has to do with um, the continuum of uh, imposing, let's say, for example, to the liver that cheeseburger at midnight. If you do one time, it's all right. If you do two times, it's okay. But if you do it too many times, the plasticity, the, flex the, the system is flexible, but it's not able to cope with changes that are repeated over time. 
so that maybe what you're going to do, not maybe, but 100% sure, what you're going to do, you're going to change the epigenome in the liver, as an example, and that change might actually result into something that's stable uh, in terms of pathology, inflammation response, uh, obesity, and so on. Thank you. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Over there. Over there, the center. And thank you for the talk. So in the uh, human, in the human body, in the, our, organism, uh, our organism, there are more uh, bacteria cell than human cell. Do you know if uh, also the bacteria work in a circadian way as well? No? Right, that, actually that's a great question. I had slides about the microbiome, but I really didn't have the time to show them to you. Um, we study the microbiome a lot. It's very exciting uh, uh, for anyone here who's not aware of this. Um, we have in our body even more bacteria than our own cells. So it's, it's, people now call it like the exogenous organ. It's an additional organ we have inside. And lots of those are in the gut, right? Not only in the gut, but mostly in the gut. Um, what we have discovered is that, and not just me, but people in the field, um, is that, um, yes, the bacteria have their own uh, of circadian activity, so that if you take bacteria from the gut of a human or a mouse, that composition will change day and night. So the number and the type and the uh, composition of those bacteria population changes. That means that their function within the gut is modified along the time, not only, but it reads and talks to the gut clock. So we have now mice where we mutated the clock only in the gut, and in those mice, the bacteria population is completely different. And the uh, crosstalk between the gut, the microbiome in the gut, and the gut itself is completely modified. So there's a crosstalk between the bacteria and the gut, and that is determined during the circadian cycle through the clock system. I showed you one slide with all those genes changing in IFAT diet in the liver. We've done an experiment, and we show that those changes, let's say caused by the high-fat diet, are driven by the gut microbiome. So that tells you how profound the system it is, because you can change what happens in the liver through the gut microbiome. Yeah, well, one last question over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. actually we have two. Quick. <laughs> so one is, what time do you feed the... The twin mice? Can you repeat that? I mean, I... At what time do you feed the twin mice? So the slim one was having food at what time, and the fat one at what time? Did you get the question? No. I can get the question. So you said that you fed the two mice with the same diet, but at different time. Oh. What was the time you used for them? So the question is like whether I provide mice the same diet or a different diet? Yeah, you show in your paper that you were feeding twin mice with the same diet, but at different time. Oh, okay, yeah. What was the time that you used Oh, what them? was the, thank you. Okay, sorry. This, that microphone doesn't work properly. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so, uh, and a second one. So you said that there is also time for activity. What is the suggested yes. time for right. activity? So, um, and I guess you want that to be translated to humans, right? You don't care about the mouse. So, <laughs> yeah, I, know. For so, I, had that, I had that feeling that you care about the human. But so the, the, the answer is very simple. Um, for the physical activity, the best time, and again, I'm talking about the normal type. I'm not talking about me necessarily. I'm a night bird. Uh, will be um, to have activity, physical activity uh, rather late morning. That's when the highest uh, coordination uh, is available in the strongest muscle activity. That's number one. For the food, what we found, and again, when I see we, I'm not going to talk about just my lab, but at least four or five in the field, have shown that what we call time-restricted feeding is really uh, extremely beneficial. And the way to do it is to extend, I was answering the question before, uh, to extend the fasting. So instead to have breakfast as soon as you wake up, if you can resist, um, 
have a breakfast later in the morning, so you extend the breakfast, and then you have the last meal of your day, whatever is your normal type, maybe eight hours later, nine hours max. Don't go and have dinner too late. If you do this little trick, what you're going to do is to do what we call an extended fasting. That will, long, will last, let's say, from uh, 8 or 9 p.m. until 11 a.m. the day after. That's an extended fasting. That alone is beneficial for many reasons. It will increase um, your muscle uh, capacity, will make you lose weight, uh, and is even been linked to increased um, motorial coordination. Okay, thank you very much. My uh, I think we have to close here the conversation. Paul, there is a surprise for you. Okay. It's over there, look. Oops. <laughs> it's over there. Yeah, Good. right, I saw okay. it. <laughs> this is, this is uh, yeah. Yes, if. Okay, this is a present of our academic. Well, it's great for so, I did you. my PhD in Strasbourg, so... May I, 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 I'm not Thank you. Thank you. But that was before 93. <laughs> so congratulations, and... Thank you. Thank you very much very for your great talk. Very appropriate. Very appropriate.